Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for welcoming me. Um, I will start out just with a short question out of curiosity, just with raise of hands. I'm not going to pick anyone out here. Um, how many have done a little bit of media work, such as doing interviews or writing press releases and these kind of things? So, actually, the majority. How, mu how many people have done quite a bit of media work, like for some time? Fura? And how many have a lot of experience with it? And uh, who wants to mo know more about it? <laughs> okay. okay. So you came to the right one. Thank you. Okay. I just got this nice thing that can uh, change lights. I've never used it before, but uh, I'm a big believer in new technology when it helps people and animals. Um, so why should we even focus on media? I guess it's obvious for the people in here that uh, the media controls a lot of things. Um, and someone said that it controls the minds. Maybe mind control is a bit over the top, but I think we can all agree that it influences the way people think about things and especially what people have an opinion about. And uh, by the way, the guy who said these words, according to Google, is uh, the 27 Club member, uh, Jim Morrison. So, okay. So just a little bit about myself. It was already introduced, but this is kind of the slide where you have to present yourself as a credible source of information and that I have a lot of experience, so you should trust whatever I say. And uh, well, I've been campaigning for like animal rights for a decade now, and uh, I hold a master's degree in organizational communication. And I've appeared in media like hundreds of times if you count everything in. And I have experience with doing interviews and doing press releases, being part of debates on TV or radio, on doing background research, writing opinion pieces, and also taking part in a few documentary programs. But having said that, I know that opinions can differ, and of course you should be critical of whatever I say, as we all should, and uh, I'm open also to new ideas. So. When talking about media, I'm sure we could talk about this for hours and hours, but uh, we also have a lunch coming up, so uh, I will try and limit to this uh, time slot. And uh, I've decided on like a few uh, things that I want to cover. I want to go over some of the basic stuff, because we tend to sometimes forget the basic stuff when we've done it for a while and we want to get more and more advanced. And we want to have like snappy comebacks to uh, like annoying uh, TV reporter or something. And let's be honest, it's not every day that an annoying TV reporter shows up and asks some difficult questions that we have to answer. But uh, very often we have opportunities to just get on the media with some simpler stories and we shouldn't miss those opportunities. So that's why I put that in. Um, having said that, we also want to be good at handling the interview whenever it appears because that can be the most scary situation that you're in because this is where every word counts. And then uh, finally, I brought like a few cases that I want to have a look at uh, together with you to show some of the points made earlier in the presentation. So, don't forget MIB. And uh, when I say MIB, I of course mean the most important basics and not this movie from the 90s. Um, let's get into it. So first we need to understand the game. And uh, you all know that there are these news criteria that journalists use when they have to pick a story. So, I mean, we cannot just come and say, well, pigs on factory farms are suffering because it's not really news. It's been like that for a number of years, and unfortunately, it will be like that for another number of years. So, whenever we have, like, we want to make a story about pigs suffering on animal factory farms, we need to look at some news criteria and see how can we actually make an angle to make this story relevant to this journalist so it will actually be part of the mass media and not part of our social media or our leaflets and these kind of things which are also important but which will probably not make it to the mainstream media. So when I talk about media here, it's mostly the mainstream media like newspapers and TV and radio. Uh, so first, like there are so many news criteria, and I've just included a few of them which I think are probably the most important but if you Google it you can come up with maybe 20 or 25 news criteria, and they are all valid to some extent. But sensation, it has to be spectacular, it has to be like if you imagine this graph of things happening, you have to like hit the high ends and high notes. And if you just take like in the middle thing, then the journalist will not be as interested. Also, the conflict. Everybody loves a good conflict. So if there is a fight going on, people disagreeing or calling each other names and these kind of things, that's really like uh, a nice dish for the, a journalist. 
Uh, identification is really important. Uh, often we will have some sort of news which might qualify as a academic news, some philosophical ideas about am animals having rights or uh, some statistics about something, but you have to relate it to the audience. And the audience here will be what we could call Mr. and Mrs. Jones, like an average person in your country. Not that there is this average person, they never exist, but just imagine like a general TV viewer, radio listener, newspaper reader or whatever. Um, so you always have to find a way how to identify with this. How can you make this story relevant to their everyday life? Where do they do their shopping? Where do they like get their ideas from? Uh, so you kind of meet them at, at, at their point of view, so to speak. We, we will look at a few examples later on. Uh, immediacy, so we all know that uh, like last week's news is old news, so we always have to kind of, as much as possible, find a new relevant angle to things, otherwise it's not really relevant for, to, to a journalist. So for instance, if you send out a press release, if you try and follow up the next week and say, oh, did you see that we sent out this press release last week, the journalist will be, oh, last week, well, good luck. Um, proximity, like how close is the news that we're talking about? If something is going on in China, it has to be really, really, really horrible for it to make the news in Denmark or Luxembourg or whatever place in Europe. Uh, so the closer and the more local the story is, the higher the probability of the journalist wanting to, to make it is. And then I added my own kind of <laughs> news criteria, maybe it's already out there, but celebrities. For some reason, whenever a celebrity is uh, getting a new haircut or wearing new shoes or saying something irrelevant about something, it's kind of a news. And we all know that we can like, use celebrities and that's what Peter has been doing for like 30 plus years and uh, with uh, a great amount of success, you could say, at least in, in getting out the, their, their messages. Um, so let's just go to the beginning, how to create a story. So. I just put out a small checklist for the pre-launch, pre -launch, so that would be before you actually have the story out in the media. First, you will need to identify and create the story. Um, and I mean, often we might tend to think that we should create all the stories ourselves. It should be our campaigns and our facts, our blah, blah, blah. And well, this is great whenever you have it, but uh, let's also be honest that we cannot kind of create all stories ourselves. We cannot create hundreds of stories if we're just like a small organization with a few people employed or it's just all volunteer based. So it could also be a good idea to identify stories that are taking place in like other parts of your country or even internationally and see how could this be relevant to our audience? Could we kind of make a twist or an angle on this and, and make it relevant to, to like a, a large number of people? So after creating the story, you have to create or like assemble, I would say, sufficient background info, and that would be for your own purpose solely. So whatever I will do, if, if we have a story coming up, especially if it's like like a topic that I'm not like so keen on that I haven't really gone into, like I remember at some point we were doing like uh, a story about fashion, about these exotic skins from snakes and reptiles, and I've, I've never like done any campaigns on that, so I really had to read up on things and do some research um, in order for, for me to feel confident enough whenever talking to a journalist. Um, and, and I mean, it, it can be really important because I remember uh, like with this particular campaign, suddenly this journalist would call me up and he was writing a pr like uh, an article about a company that was using snake skins and he was like, well, but the company states that uh, like these snakes are from like really good snake farms in say Vietnam or Cambodia, I can't remember now. And I was like, whoa, well, I'm glad I just saw a documentary about that actually there are no snake farms in that country. So I could say that to the journalist and feel confident that, oh no, this is bullshit. Either the company is lying or like the like, producer or whatever is, is lying to, to the company. Um, and if I hadn't done my sufficient background information, I would be like, oh, well, yeah, I bet that farm is not really good or something. And then it would turn out that I was kind of not really representing the, the case in, in the best possible way. Um, also, you need a press list and what, I, what you could call a VIP list. So a press list is basically you assemble all emails, names, phone numbers if possible, but, but especially emails to send out a press release. And you can get that from all like uh, bigger uh, media outlets. And, and also you can get the, like, the personal email addresses from journalists who write stories about animal rights, animal welfare, maybe even en environmental things. So you could also look that up and say, oh, that person could be interested and they could also be added. 
and and the VIP list in this case would be like journalists who have shown interest before and made some of your stories. You could have like a small like a sheet of Excel, whatever, where you have these uh, people and you can call them when you have a story coming out and then kind of say, well, you did this early and now we have another good story. And they will tend to trust you more and be more interested in your stories because they already had some success with that. Um, then you would have to do your like uh, press, uh, send out a press release and, and have some press info uh, ready and also some material. If, if you have some footage, some pictures that would also be relevant to, to be able to send out. So all this you need to have prepared before even like calling uh, a journalist uh, because otherwise you will suddenly have to work really fast to produce it. So whenever you are ready with this, uh, it's time to charge and, uh, and launch your story. I don't know how many have played this uh, nice board game of Risk, like where have you have to conquer the world. And uh, sometimes it also feels like that when you're ready to do a press release, it's like really exciting. You're moving in with your troops and you have to roll the dice because there is also a big ch like element of chance and, and luck when doing media work. You cannot always say, well, this, this story got really big because we're so great or this story didn't get anywhere because we are lousy. It's like, well, sometimes you have an idea that this is a good story and it might get w somewhere, but some things are really like some big media outlet picks it up and then it just goes everywhere. And other times some terrorist attack happened somewhere else and you had a really good story, but it was not good enough to make it to the media that day. And yeah, that's a tough life. So when you launch, the first thing you ideally would do would be to pitch the story. So that is simply just calling the journalist, contacting the journalist, and then do the elevator speak and say, well, I will just tell you about the story in 45 seconds. Like these animals are suffering. We have some great footage and this and this is going on and we have some quotes and we can provide this and this for you. Would you be interested? Uh, and sometimes you have like such a really good story that you want to make it a solo to the like news, uh, to the reporter or the, the journalist, because they will often be interested if they can do the story solo. But you don't have to do it. You really have to kind of make a like decision whether this should be a solo story, because the good thing is that they might make a bigger story out of it, but the bad thing is that they will make it first. And sometimes that makes other like uh, news media like hesitant to do it because that's a immediacy thing that, oh, well, it's already been told that story and it's not, it's not our story anymore. So, so that's some of the things you have to consider. Uh, so next up, you uh, send out your press release. Um, and uh, so even if like a media has gotten it as a soul, you can still send out the press release after whatever date you, you agreed upon when it should be open to anyone. After that, usually after that, you can also do your social media to kind of, you know, give your story more uh, yeah, more play, more airtime, and send it out on, on Facebook or whatever social media you have. Sometimes it could also be an idea to do the social media first. We'll look at, at one example later where that was the case, at least that's what we des decided to do. And then also, if the story is good enough, you should do some follow-up work if possible. I will just pick out two of these and just go a little bit more into detail. So the an anatomy of a press release, I'll, I'll go over th through it quickly because I think most of you have read uh, and some of you have even written press releases, so you basically have the idea. But the way I see it is just this, I've taken the example of uh, some made up uh, company called Oh Happy Days, which is a supermarket and uh, they're selling cage eggs. So a catchy headline would be where you send the press release, like the journalist will only see the subject line, so you have to have a really good headline. So they will actually be interested in opening it because if it's too boring, then well, they will never read the story. So here it would be like 25,000 consumers are boycotting this really big supermarket. Oh, so that should be enough for the journalist to be okay. Let's see what's, what's going on. So next you'll have the quick overview of the story, just giving the facts, not very like loaded terms, just pretty, this is what's going on. So despite their branding themselves as a st sustainable company, blah, 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 they continue to sell eggs from battery hens and this uh, animal rights organizations are mad about it and want to change it. Okay, now after reading four lines, the journalists know exactly what the story about and can decide whether or not this is interesting or not. Then you can add some more like a personal quote the, the good thing about using quotes is this is where you can have the loaded terms and say, well, this is outrageous, this is really bad, and we believe this and that. If you put that in, in, the, in the main text, it will come off a little bit like uh, propaganda or something. So, so it will not be taken. So it is kind of the, the wrong style to put. You, you can put the personal style in, 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 the, in, the, in the quotes, but, but you shouldn't put them outside the quotes, I would argue. 
then you can add some more like story, like factual things. So how many cage hens are then in your country, blah, blah, blah. This is like the background info that is important for the journalist also. But if you start out with that, which you, you would do if you were writing maybe an ac academic paper, it would be too boring and it would be a, take a long time before the journalist would actually get to the point of this particularly immediate, interesting story that they could actually do. And if you have some extras like pictures, film, all these kind of things, you could also like send that for, for download and, and tell them, well, this is uh, free of, you can use it wherever and just credit our organization or whoever uh, got, got those things, you can add that. So that's kind of the basics of a press release and there may be ways to alter that in, in some ways. And some people even argue that press releases are a thing of the past and you should just write some press info and that is a discussion that's going on and I'm not really sure where that will end. So, But bear in mind that maybe the press release is kind of had its uh, like heydays and, and we should consider doing things in a different way but for now I would still argue that a press release is a, normally a good thing. But you should also know that most press releases are not picked up. They get like hundreds of press releases every day and they only pick a few out of them. So you have to have the best whenever you, you do it. So this is about the follow-up. When opportunity knocks, you should uh, follow up. And uh, when uh, following up, you could look for these things. You could see if there are relevant updates to the story. So if we take the example from before with the, the supermarket uh, wanting to go cage-free, or, or we want them to go cage-free at least. Um, so an update could be that the supermarket is responding to the consumers and saying, well, our cage hens are really happy hens and blah, blah, blah. They live really great lives. And then you have an update saying, well, now they're taking some sort of action or that they're lying about this or whatever. And, and it could be relevant for the journalist to kind of pursue the story even more. Uh, you could also see if you could find new angles. So it could be in this same case, it could be that one of the supermarkets also carry foie gras on its shelves, which is to some extent even worse. And you could be, well, not only are they selling like KGX, they're also selling foie gras, and then you can kind of make a new story within that story. So it's, it's like when you've already opened the door, like you have more opportunities to follow up, whereas if, if, if you hadn't had that first opening story, it would be much harder to break through the, the media wall or the media barrier. Um, so you could also elaborate in an opinion piece or a letter to the editor. So this is where you can write this very long. It's not like a press release, it's more like your opinion. And that could be more everyday language like, well, as a campaigner, we always come across this problem that companies are saying that they're really good like citizens or like really good entities, but in reality, they carry animal abuse in their products, blah, 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 blah. And then you can write this whole thing. And because it's already been in the media, the media will be more likely to pick it up. So those would be the, like the good timings for, for doing the, these things. It, it does take some time to write a really good opinion piece, but when you consider that you can reach like tens of thousands of people with that message, it, it might be worth worthwhile actually doing it. And, and I think this is also some of the, the, the basics that we tend to forget because now we are onto some other campaign thing and then we forget to, like there was actually kind of some low hanging fruit that we could have picked. And I've, I've, I've been, been, been guilty myself in, in not doing these things. So this is also a, a note to myself. Um, so now we move on to the interview part and uh, I will just quickly see how I'm doing with the time. And, uh, well, good. Um, so how do we excel when doing the interview? Um, well, let me see. If uh, one way to look at it could be to compare like the examination process and the interview process, because I could start out with like the question, how many in here have done like a really good like media interview and really feel like you nailed it, like this was the time. So hands up, a few. Very good. Okay. So how many in here have ever been to an examination at any point in their school and they feel like they nailed it? Yes. And why is that? Because we have a lot of experience with doing examinations. That's what we're brought up to do. And we get a mark, we get a grade. So even if we thought we did horribly, we still got an A and we were like, oh, really? I didn't know I was that great. Um, so now we'll just try and make this uh, easy comparison because I think if, if you think of the interview situation in a little bit like the way you think of an examination, I think you, you can use that uh, as a way to actually do, do better at your interviews. So um, as you can see, there is you uh, and you're running towards a goal. You want to get to the finish line with your uh, message. Um, and in between that finish line, there's an obstacle. So at the examination, the obstacle will be the teacher asking you all sorts of questions. And in the interview, that will be the, the reporter or the journalist. And you want to, as much as possible, you want to avoid the obstacle or just kind of jump the fence, so to speak. Um, so what do you do? 
Um, you have to do your preparation. So for an exam, you will prepare like all your answers, all your knowledge, all that stuff. Well, it's kind of the same with doing all your sufficient background information. You have to prepare what do I want to say, what are the most important things. Maybe it's a little bit different in the way that to an examination you have to know everything and you have to have an answer even for the things that are not so important. Whereas an interview, you want to do your own prioritizing of what is most important for you to speak. So, so it's a little bit different, but more, more or less the same. When we talk about the obstacle, you have to adjust a little bit for the level of challenge. So the, the challenge level at the examination is that you have a teacher whose knowledge is mostly much better than yours. They tend to know everything and you tend to know like half of it or how, however good you are. Uh, whereas with a journalist, it's the opposite. Like the journalists usually don't know as much as you do. You, you will be the expert. Um, so you can easy, more easily get away with being the expert if you actually dare to be the expert. Whereas in the examination, you're like the low, like the thing looking up to your teacher. So, so, so that's in a way a good thing. So the, the bad news is the helpfulness is a little bit different. I would argue that the teacher has like a better interest in you performing well because it will reflect well on the teacher. And often the teacher will be the guy, if you can see the picture, like holding the hand and trying to get you uh, uh, like across the obstacle. Whereas a journalist works in a different way, they, have, like, they like the conflict and they like to kind of put you on thin ice and, and see if they can make you slip a little bit. So that would be more like the guy with the boots trying to kick you down and say, well, you're not going to get past this. So don't let the journalist ask you too many questions that can't, may, may backfire on you. Uh, eventually, uh, your message. So it's a little bit different audience you have at the examination. It's the teacher and it's the teacher that's going to give you the grades. Whereas in the interview, you have the interviewer asking you questions, but at the end of the day, you don't care at all what the interviewer, well, you care a little bit because you want to get back again, so you don't want to kind of be like really uh, like a, a pain in, in, in the ass. But, uh, but, but your real audience is like the people watching. Uh, so you want to deliver your me message to them. So, so those are the important ones. So th those are the ones giving you the grades and they're giving you the grades in, in terms of how they actually understand your message, if they feel empowered, if they feel like they want to make changes and these kind of things. So, so, so you have to think of your audience. So a more like, similar way to see it is just this uh, example of uh, your free kick in, in soccer. So these guys with the wall, that's a journalist trying to like, make it hard for you to put the ball in the goal. So uh, please uh, be careful. So, how do we do? I've already pointed a bit to it, but uh, how do we conquer the wall? So one thing is the preparation. I cannot, I, I will say this a few times because I think that is the most important thing. Uh, I've tried in the beginning when I did media work to not prepare for like a TV debate and it wasn't the, the most pretty thing I've, 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 I've tried. It was like, just came there and thought, well, yeah, I can probably do it. And I got all kinds of questions and I didn't have a plan what exactly I wanted to say. And it ended up being not my best performance. And that's where I decided, okay, next time I'll really prepare. And, and I, actually I will advise, unless you like a really a natural who can just say whatever you want. Uh, like there were a few people like that, but I think most people will feel more confident if they actually write out exactly what they want to say. Like often I will have like three or four sentences. This is exactly, if I could say it any way I wanted, this was a perfect way. Like if you write a press release, you write a press release to yourself and I, I really want to get this, this sentence out. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm taking off like at an examination. Yes, I got this sentence out. I got this sentence out and I got this sentence out. Um, and then you just see all the questions coming as obstacles as how can I get to get to this sentence in some way? Because I know that is the important thing that, that I want to say for, to, to actually make people care more about the animals or, or change their habits or whatever. Um, also be aware that how you say things are at least as important as what you say. It's not about just having the right arguments. We all know that that if you can say things with like some self-confidence, with some calm and not be too stressed or too nervous or like be looking everywhere with your eyes, I mean, people will, will, will sense that. And, and to relate to that is also the, that your appearance is important. Uh, you have to like be a nice personality, not be too angry. Like people tend to like shy away from angry people and like, oh, I don't want to hear this and oh, I don't want to be like that person. So you have to be like someone that people look up to in a sense in the way that you present your, your, your material or your arguments. Uh, and also like just the th simple thing of dress will like wear something nice and maybe be a little bit too conservative. Like don't wear your black hoodie at the interview. You can save it for like Sunday evening or whatever. Um, that's what I would advise. Um, and also, don't take like, questions, and especially critical, critical questions, too literal. 
Um, and I think this is a big thing because we tend to in our like day-to-day -day life with friends and family, when people ask us a question, we really want to answer that question. But when journalists ask a question, it's mostly to kind of keep the momentum going and it's kind of a play, it's a theatrical play, like I ask questions, you answer questions, and often the journalists don't really know what is the best question, so you kind of have to help the journalist and help the audience and help the animals by replying what you want. So often you can start off by replying a little bit to that question, but if it's a really bad question that doesn't really help anything, you'll kind of divert it uh, to, to, to the way you want to see it. And, and to me that was a difficult thing because it's not really natural for you to kind of start off like answering and then change the line, but I mean you see politicians do it all the time and they are in some way masters of like <laughs> doing critical interviews because if they had to answer all questions like in the perfect way all, always like they, they, would, uh, they would lose ground. Um, and always remember that journalists are journalists. They have a different agen agenda. They have these news criteria. They love the conflict. They love all these kind of clickbait things. Um, they don't really want you necessarily to look good. I mean, there are exceptions to that, but always think of, think of it in that way. And they love to play the devil's advocate. That's the way they ask questions. They, they will always ask like, oh, so isn't this kind of a stupid campaign or is this really important? I hence really like, do they have a brain or like they will ask all these kind of questions to kind of make you uncertain and you should never kind of like give in to that and say, oh well yeah, maybe the brains are not so big, but blah blah blah. It should be more like, well yes, they're really smart and actually did you know that? And this is why we do this. Um so so I mean I, I remember even one time I had this like live interview about fur animals and this like journalist was just being critical as they always are like, oh, so is it really right to go into farms and take pictures and uh, is it okay and isn't it just a few bad farms and the others are good and can't remember all the questions. But I was just answering and being like, oh yeah, this is how the game is. And then afterwards when the, like, the cameras were off, she turned to me and she was like almost apologetic, like, yeah, I'm sorry, like I have to ask questions in this way. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, I understand. So, but it, it like, probably she was sympathetic to whatever I had to say, but like her role as a journalist was just, I have to ask these questions in this particular way, sorry. So just be prepared for that and don't hate the journalist and don't be like, like, oh, I already answered this and this, like, this is not what you want to do. And this is what makes the headline, like the guy goes crazy on a journalist and everybody, <laughs> everybody loves these things. So, so please. Please like keep your calm and do deep breathing and meditation or whatever it works for you. So there are a few different kinds of interviews. I'm just looking at the clock again to make sure that I'm on time. Uh, so you should know the difference. Uh, one thing is a background interview. So it's just a journalist who might be interested in a story and it's not a story yet. So it's like, what do you know about this or that industry about like feathers and duvets and pillows? And this is the time where you can just take it easy and say, okay, I'll, I'll find out. It's, it's, it's not like you're in the spotlight. So, so just be of service and see if you can help the journalist actually make a story. Um, another thing is like news articles. It's just people like the journalist working online, maybe just calling you, oh, could you have a comment for this? And the good news is here that often you will have some time to actually come up with an answer. So if you're not sure, just say, okay, well, I will find out for you and uh, I'll, 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 I'll give you an answer. This is totally acceptable in many cases. Like, okay, I'll just ask my colleague or I'll, I'll look it up. I cannot just answer you straight away because often we will have a tendency that, oh, I have to come up with an answer and then you come up like, with not the best answer because you weren't really prepared for it. So, and the hard thing, of course, is what we talked about, the radio and TV interview where you have to like, every word is counting and you have to be really careful what you say. Uh, and also you have to be aware whether this is a live interview where everything you say will be there. So that in a way makes it more pressure on you because, oh, I don't have to stumble with my words and I don't have to like get the black screen or whatever. But at the same time, whatever you say will get there. So even if they ask like stupid questions, you can just answer it in, in a different way and there's not so much time to edit it out. Whereas with the taped interviews where they just, they can like interview you for half an hour and then they will edit it down to like 30 seconds. So if you just say one stupid thing, well, you can be sure this is, yeah, this is great though. Now the person is kind of like fiddling and mumbling or whatever. Like often they will not take the mumbling things, but they will take some things if you like uh, believe something that sounds really odd to, to the audience or if, if the journalist is really critical. So. So that, that's why I advise that you only have maybe two or three main points and you will always go back to them because then the journalists will keep asking, but isn't there another reason? Like, isn't this bad? And then eventually end up on your 10th priority and say, okay, well, yeah, you could also argue this. And they were like, ah, oh, this is your argument. And you're like, ah, not really. I had like three others that you didn't think were important. 
Um, and the last point here is sometimes say no thanks. You might come across journalists wanting to make a story and it's just a story about making you look bad. Like, I can't remember exactly, but we had some journalists calling us about something with like dogs and homeless people and it was like kind of thing where we had to take sides which are more important like dogs or homeless people and something we were like no 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 we're not going to get into this kind of talk you, you can just do this without us because we, we're not going to to participate in that kind of story um so it's not that all media is good media maybe most media is an opportunity but sometimes it's a trap and you just stay out of it please a few more things you don't have to know everything it's a big thing it is okay to be honest and say well I will find out. Maybe you shouldn't say, I don't know, but you could say, well, what we know is this or something else, or I will find this out for you. Um, keep it simple. So even if you have a lot of knowledge about some industry and you know all the facts and figures, be careful with just ranting on, on facts and figures. You have to keep it simple. You have to make people emotionally involved. In this case, you have to like talk to people in a way where they feel engaged to do something. So you have to reach this um, familiar Mr. and Mrs. Jones. Uh, and then watch what you say, like even if a journalist is calling you up for some whatever background thing, like if you say something that you don't want to end up in print, like oh yeah, we actually believe this is really <laughs> like then you shouldn't say it, like, like a journalist is not your confident, like it's not like a person you can trust as like your mother or your brother or your best friend, so, so, so really like be careful to not say things that you don't want eventually to be broad broadcasted. Um, so, now we'll get to the cases, I've brought a few, um, because often we can learn a lot from things that has actually happened and not some theoretical things that we will make up. So the first one is uh, this story, I don't know how many have seen this story with the foxes from Finland that just came out recently, show of hands. Oh yeah, most of you. So it's actually a really good example, like it's these breeding uh, foxes from the fur industry and it, like they, they grow really big so they have like, like a lot of uh, like fur on them uh, and they have miserable lives and they get some injuries on their feet and, and all kinds of things. Um, but it's a good example of, uh, well one thing is that uh, the Finnish organization that like posted it were really happy to share it with other animal rights groups and uh, other media whereas sometimes organizations can be like oh this is our story and we don't want to share it but it actually ended up uh, getting around to more than 50 countries including China and some Arabic countries which, which is really amazing. Also shows the thing that we talked about that sometimes you also get lucky. Yeah, I have five more minutes, great. <laughs> we'll see if I make it. Um, so, okay. So the key words here that this was a sensation because the animals are like, it, it's a different side of, of the fur industry you see. Um, we, we managed to get it in the Norwegian news by making this uh, proximity thing, just stating that okay these are like these big brands are selling these uh, things so it's not something just going on in Finland it's something that the Norwegian people buy on the main shopping streets and then it became this sh like identification story about oh this is actually a consumer story that the consumers go in here and they buy these kind of animals uh, pills okay let's uh, go to the next one uh, this is a story about uh, Reitzen, which is like uh, the owner of 7-Eleven and also a supermarket store in, in, uh, in Scandinavia and the Baltic countries. They went cage-free and just a small point here is, um, so it was kind of not a new story because they already did it to some extent, but now they also included some of the hidden egg, like the hidden eggs in uh, like bakery goods. So that was a new angle that we had to come up with to my, kind of make it a new story. And also the local news things uh, was that, okay, so we called up the like uh, the, the local newspaper in the city where they had the headquarters and saying, oh, they're actually going cage free. And then we're like, okay, so it's something going on in our city. So they posted it and it spread a little bit like that. So it was like a story that wasn't so big, but we still managed to get a little bit out of it. Um, this is another story about some uh, mink breeder that was caught again. He had already been on television and we managed to get some uh, footage from like the government inspectors. So it says it's about finding the story that is through a freedom of information request you can actually sometimes like find a story that you get some information that you couldn't find yourself. And uh, it's also an, a, like a follow-up story that some like media outlets had already done this story so we could call those people up and say well we actually have a follow-up story and it's an official story that we got from this. So it was kind of a free story that we could, that we could make. That was really nice. 
Um, another one is like we made a Danish media meat uh, video about how like animals in, on factory farms are, are raised. And instead of just doing a press release and saying, well, we have this video, we like posted it on social media first and it went viral. And then like our story was more like, oh, this viral video of farmed animals uh, is causing celebrities to skip meat because we asked some celebrities and they were posting, oh, this is a horrible video, blah, blah, blah. And then like so many media picked it up. It was like, oh, this is a viral video. Everybody's talking about it and celebrities are doing this and that. Uh, and you're like, okay, great. <laughs> so this is the example where you can do social media before well, what would have happened if we'd done it the other way around? I can't say, I can just say oh, we got a lot out of it in this way. So, so, so that could be a thing to consider once in a while. Normally I would go the, go the other way around. So I'm talking a bit fast because I'm running out of time. I will actually show you a video clip um, from uh, the story. This is an example of how you can handle cri critical questions and how hard it can be sometimes. Um, it's from six years ago, so you will, it will actually be me uh, staring in this <laughs> new thing, so it will be like going back in a time machine. Um, the story is about uh, fur animals, so there was an investigation going on in Denmark. We got hold of some uh, footage about uh, yeah, how, how the animals are treated. And uh, then the fur farmers, they some kind of desperate move, but maybe it was a clever move. They were stating, oh, this is not our animals. It's uh, some animals that have, have been placed on our farms and our cages and filmed by activists to kind of put us in a bad light. And I mean, it sounded really ridiculous. And to me, it was like, wow, really? Is that the best you can come up with? Um, but then again, it made out to, to several news about it. And uh, well, as you can see, the story became a, a lot about how can you be sure that these are not uh, like these kind of animals. So. It's in Danish, unfortunately, but I put uh, subtitles, so I hope you can all uh, be able to read it. It's like uh, four minutes, so I will just jump into it, if possible. Vi begynder med en tilspidset konflikt mellem dyreværnsaktivister og minkavlere. En østjysk minkavler går nu til angreb på aktivisterne, som han beskylder for at fuske med billeder, der angiveligt viser, at flere af hans mink bliver vandrygtet og lider af store bidsår. Lars Eilertsen er glad for sine mink. Det er en sort mink, vi har her. Men i dag er humøret i bund. Det er dybt frustrerende for mig og min familie at opleve, at sådan noget foregår. Det er nøjagtigt som, at de har gået ind i vores eget hjem. Midt om natten den 5. oktober bryder dyreværnsaktivister ind på Lars Eilersens minkfarm. Bevæbnet med kamera filmer de mink, der som her har alvorlige bidmærker på bagbenene eller store sår på siden af kroppen. I burerne ligger der også døde dyr. Billederne er optaget i Lars Eilersens stald, men ifølge minkavleren er det ikke hans dyr. De er blevet placeret i hans bure, lyder forklaringen. Jeg har klart den formodning, at man har været på stedet her for at, filme, for at finde skader og har ikke kunnet finde nogen, og har måttet derfor vende tilbage med skadedyr for at sætte mig i et dårligt lys. Men er det ikke langt ude for Jo, den er meget langt ude, men øh, jeg er helt øh, overbevist om, at øh, motiverne her de er så stærke for at gøre det, at... Øh, det er sådan, jeg tror, det hænger sammen. I går blev han konfronteret med optagelserne. I aften bliver det vist på Danmarks Radio. Det er dyreværnsforeningen Anima, der har fået fat i optagelserne. Nu frygter han at blive hængt ud som dyremishandler. Der er ikke mere spørgsmål om, at du simpelthen ikke er i stand til at passe din dyr godt nok? Nej, det øh, vil jeg sige. at øh, når de, de, de to dyr, som jeg blev vist i går, de er så beskadige, som de er, så er det helt usandsynligt. Lars Ejlersen er vred over det natlige besøg. Når man kommer om natten, så må det være, fordi man har et, øh, et falsk hjerne. Ja, det kunne også være for at afsløre minkavler, der ikke passer deres dyr godt nok. Jamen, så synes jeg, de skulle komme bank på min dør først i hvert fald, og spørge, om de må se mine dyr. Og det må de se enhver tid. Torbjørn Schønning, du er dyrevandsaktivist fra Anima. Hvordan kan du være sikker på, at de beviser på dyremishandling, som I siger, I har modtaget fra en anonym kilde, ikke er plantet, som vi hører minkavleren beskylde jer for? I'll just pause quickly and just explain the background. So this is like early at night but it was a long day so I look a bit tired at least I managed to dress up well but I don't look too happy <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't look too happy but I also look like not happy enough I guess uh, it was very stressful because it was supposed to be in a studio and then last minute like oh the studio was busy so they're like oh let's go somewhere else and it was just in a busy ale and people walking by and they were like oh you're on in one minute and, I was like, and then there's also the thing when it's taking place in different cities there will be like this lack of time so like you get the question but you hear it like five seconds later like when you see an Olympic so that kind of makes more funny and you see that she's starting off with this like really critical question so and you like you, you you're there and you want to talk about the animals and you're like how can you be sure that this is not like a fake story and uh, okay so I try to kind of reply first and then try to get more into what I want to say but you can see how it goes 
vidnet, som vi hører minkavleren beskylde jer for? Det her det er useriøs spænd grebet ud af den blå luft fra en desperat branche, som ikke har nogen gode argumenter tilbage. Så nu må de prøve at flytte fokus ved at tale om alt muligt andet. Men hvordan kan du være sikker på, at de, at de beviser ikke er plantet? Fordi det er en langt ude påstand, som er grebet ud af den blå luft. Mængavlerne må komme med nogle håndfaste beviser på det her, i stedet for at flytte fokus. Det, det drejer sig om, det er, at mængden lider i Danmark, og det er det, som forskningen i lang tid har vist. I 2009 forbød et enigt folketing at forbyde revavl i Danmark, på, på baggrund af, at man ikke kan tilbyde dem ordentlige velfærdsforhold. Og det samme, de samme argumenter gør sig gældende for mængavl. So she just asked the same question two times, and then I'm like, okay, this is going bad. So I have to try and talk about something else. Like, this is really bad, and we have these other problems that I want to talk about. So you can guess what her next question is. Men hvordan kan du være sikker på, at de ikke er plantet i stedet for at det bare er et godt argument? Jamen altså optagelserne er vel dokumenteret med avlskort og GPS-koordinater. Altså det er avlerne, der skal komme og bevise, at der er blevet plantet nogle dyr. Det virker helt øh, vanvittigt, at nogle dyrevenner skulle køre rundt med 400 døde og lemlæstede mink på et ladvogn, og så gå ind med dem og filme dem igen. Det er simpelthen for langt ud. So still trying, and at this point I was like, wow, does she not have any other questions? And like in, in retrospect, I'm kind of like, okay, maybe I should have given like longer answers instead of just giving her a new like opportunity to put out a new wall and just trying to kick me down. It's like, I, I should have taken more talk time for sure. But at least I had done my preparation, so I had a new like answer all the time to how can you be sure? Well, there are GPS and there are these. So it's like you get this new information out, so it doesn't sound too ridiculous. At least it's like okay, new information and new points. So and now she's actually asking a new question. So how is it okay to break the law? Thank you so much. Mingaul er jo lovligt i Danmark, så hvad berettiger jer som dyrevandsaktivister til at bryde loven og bryde ind hos en mingaulere, som jeres anonyme kilder har gjort i det her tilfælde? Ja, nu skal det jo siges, at det er nogle optagelser, vi har modtaget. Men altså overalt, hvor der findes dyremishandling, er det vigtigt, at det kommer frem. Og hvis det betyder, at der er nogen, der må kravle over et hegn for at kunne dokumentere det her, så, så det er det noget, vi godt kan leve med. Then I was thinking, okay, now I answered another critical question. Maybe there will be like, so what is the whole point of this? What do you try to achieve? Or what is the main problem in the mink industry, according to you, something? But then, like, five times in a row, how can you be sure that, oh. Men hvordan kan vi så være sikre på, at I ikke også er villige til at plante beviser for at fremme jeres sag? Jamen altså, det, det grebet ud af den blå luft. Altså, der har været lignende påstand i Norge, hvor det også blev bevist, at, at det bare var, var spændt fra pelsbranchen, hvor madtilsynet gik ud og sagde, at, at det havde slet ikke noget hold i sig. Så altså, det er en velkendt strategi fra pelsavneren at prøve at flytte fokus, fordi de ikke har lyst til at tale om dyrevelfærd, fordi dyrevelfærd og minkproduktion hænger bare ikke sammen. Mange tak skal du have. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So this is what you call another day at the office, um, and I mean, I got away with it, I think, but it was not the nicest experience. We're coming to an end now because we're running out of time. I'm just gonna get to this. If you want, afterwards you can come and talk to me. You can also write me if you have more questions. I don't know if we have time for one question or something yes, like that. Yes, we have five minutes. Okay, so thank you.